This morning, I, I want to share with you a message simply titled, The Secret. How many of you like secrets? Don't lie. How many of you like secrets? Huh? Come on. Be honest. How many of you like a good secret? Secrets make us feel powerful, don't they? Huh? Am I right? Secrets make us feel powerful. I know something you don't know. I'm not going to tell you. And then they beg all day long. Tell me. No, just tell me. Just tell me. Like, nope, not going to tell you. Secrets make us feel powerful. Amen. Well, I got a secret for you today. It's not my secret. It's Paul's secret. And I believe it's probably one of the most powerful secrets we'll ever hear. So I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. As you're turning there, I kind of set the scene. Paul is in prison. He's been in prison for preaching the gospel. And while he's in prison, he begins to write these letters to these places that he's ministered to before. And not so much the places, but the people. Paul is writing a message to to people that he has either led to the Lord or he has shared the gospel with. These letters that he writes while he's in prison, we, we know them as the epistles or the prison letters of Paul to the churches that he has helped establish or been a part of. And the book of Philippians is one of those letters. It's a letter from Paul to the believers in Philippi. And he's writing from a very gloomy place. Anybody ever been in prison? Anybody here ever been in prison? Joel, that's a bad time to reach up and grab the camera. (laughs) Anybody ever been in prison? It's not a fun place, right? It's not a cool place. I mean, it's not like they're giving you five-star meals and you got a great place to lay your head. But if you think prisons are bad now, you should have been where Paul was. Okay, the, the, the only way I can even come close to, to comprehending what this place was like. Anybody ever been to Zanzibar and gone on the, uh, the old slave tour and, and ever been down into the place where they, they kept the slaves? Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you take the tour over by the old church and, and you go down into where they held the slaves before they brought them out. I remember the first time I went through there, it was so scary. And that's the only way I can begin to comprehend anything close to where Paul was. But it wasn't a fun place, and it wasn't a great place. But Paul shares one of the most powerful, powerful secrets from one of the darkest places that he'd ever been. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. Paul's writing to the church, and this is what he says. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Let's stop right there for just a second. How many of you wish you could be happy every day? How many of you wish you could just simply be content every day no matter what's going on? How many of you know people like that and they drive you crazy? Huh? But they drive us crazy. Why do they drive us crazy? Because we're jealous. Let's just be honest. They drive us crazy because we're jealous of them. But we're jealous because we haven't quite figured out the secret. But Paul says, I'm going to share with you the secret of how to be content in any and every situation. You guys should be on the edge of your seat for this, really. He says, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here it is, verse 13. 
I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Heavenly Father, let us hear the truth of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I, I don't know, but there, there are scholars and theologians that say that Philippians 4.13 may be the one verse in Scripture that is misused more than any other verse. Because we like to read it and we like to take it and use it for just about anything and everything that we can't accomplish. I've got exams coming up and I haven't studied a bit. I haven't prepared and I'm not ready. So what do we walk in the classroom and we quote Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, And we use that verse out of context. And that context uh, of this verse was not so that you can do anything in the world. The verse is simply used to let us know that in any situation or circumstances, we can make it through. Good times or bad times. We're going to look at it just a little bit deeper this morning. I, I love verse 10. Because I really think verse 10 sets the stage for everything Paul's about to say. And it simply says, I rejoice greatly in what? In the Lord. I don't rejoice in my bank account. I don't rejoice in my situation or my circumstance. I don't rejoice in my relationships. I don't rejoice in my job. I don't rejoice in my popularity. I don't rejoice in my position of power. I don't rejoice because I have a lot of influence, but I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord. Now, I... If if I'm not mistaken, and you could you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the word says that the Lord never changes. Is that right? If, If the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the Lord never changes, if we will learn to rejoice in the Lord rather than in everything else, we'll always be able to rejoice. Because the Lord never changes. You see, the reality is this. I rejoice greatly in the Lord may be one of the most profound statements that we'll ever hear out of Scripture. I rejoice in the Lord. Not in anything else. Simply in the Lord. Things change. Situations change. People change. Hello. How many of you have known people all your life and they ain't the same people today that they were yesterday? I see that hand, Effie. People change. But the Lord never changes. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. It could be one of the most profound statements we ever hear. Because the reality is this, is our contentment, our happiness, is not circum. Substantial. As followers of Christ, our contentment is spiritual. As followers of Jesus, our contentment should not be based upon our circumstances, but upon our relationship with Jesus. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. He says, whether well-fed or hungry, in plenty or want, in any or every situation, he has learned to be content. But unfortunately, in the world we live in today, there's a lot of things that battle our contentment. Somebody say amen. I I believe the smarter we get, the more advanced we become, the less happy we are. You ever notice that? You ever notice that the more you have, the more you want? More is not always best. I I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be reading from verse 25 all the way to verse 34. And it's Jesus teaching, and he's teaching about worry. 
How many of you are worried this morning? Raise your hand. There's something going on in your life and you're worried. Raise your hand. How many of you got worries today? Oh, don't lie. Just be honest. Half of you raise your hand. That means the other half of you are probably lying. Okay. Most of us are worried about something. We got worries. Amen. I want you to hear what Jesus says about worry this morning. I don't want you just to hear it. I want your heart to absorb it this morning. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Look at your neighbor and say, don't worry. Be happy. I can hear that whistle. <laughs> can you hear it? Come on. Let that play in the background. There you go. I know. You know it. Listen. Come on now. It says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Or about your body, what you will wear? Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. There's that statement again. I think God's trying to to talk to us at the ocean. You remember last week? Where is your faith? Anybody remember that from last week? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows. Your heavenly father knows. Let me say that again. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. How many times in our lives do we put the things of God second? Especially in those times where we're troubled. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. I I, I want to stop for just a moment and just point out something in that verse. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. So many times we we don't have an issue seeking the kingdom of God. But when it comes to his righteousness, that becomes a challenge. Because so many of us, when it comes time to, to, to be in need and we begin to, out of desperation, cry out to God, we 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 have no problem seeking his kingdom blessings. but yet we refuse to place ourselves inside of his boundaries. We cannot live to please ourselves, but ask God to bless it. But what he says here, what Jesus is saying is, if you will seek the kingdom of God, if, if you will set your focus where it needs to be, and if you will get yourself right... Righteous means to be in right standing with. Doesn't mean to be perfect. Hello, hear me. To be righteous doesn't mean to be perfect. There is no one perfect except Jesus. But it's to be in right relationship with the one who is perfect. To be righteous isn't to be perfect, but it's to be in right relationship with. Let's don't confuse the two. Okay? Righteousness is not perfection. It's to be in right relationship with Jesus. 
So he, he says, if, if you will set your focus where it needs to be, and if you'll get in right relationship with the Lord, he will begin to bless you. Problem is, is we want all of the blessings before that happens. We say, well, God, if you'll bless me, then I'll become righteous. It's awful quiet in here this morning, June. He says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Somebody say amen. Jesus says, do not worry. The reality is that sometimes when we face hard times, we simply want God to remove them. Somebody say amen. But can I tell you that that's probably a mistake? What we really need to ask for is this. Don't ask for God to remove it, but ask God for the strength to get through it. Why? Because God is working a process in our lives through every situation. In any and every situation, God is working in our lives. And the truth is simply this, is those things that we call setbacks are normally setups for the Lord. Those things that we think that happen to us in life that set us back really become setups for God to do what God wants to do in us and through us. So don't pray for God to remove it. Pray that God will give you strength to get through it. Why? Because he's working something in our lives for our good. Remember, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. God is working something in our lives in the good times and in the bad. And what I find is it's, it's mostly in the bad times, Jackson, that he's doing the most work in me. It's mostly in the struggles and and the challenges. What we call setbacks, God views as as setups. And the the secret to to contentment is simply this, is that I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Three things this morning as as we talk about contentment. Three things I want to share with you quickly is simply this. When we're, when we're talking about contentment and we're learning what it is to be happy and not to worry and we're working out this secret in our lives, there's three things that we must do. The first one is simply this, is we must be willing to submit to the sovereignty of God. Submit to his sovereignty. Submit to his sovereignty. What's that mean? Well, we've already read that, that God knows everything. How many of you, if I asked you this morning, do you believe in God? You'd raise your hand. Some of you, not all of you. Lord, move in the house today in Jesus' name. We need to have revival. Come on now. We say we believe in God, but do we truly believe in God? That that God is sovereign. That, That word sovereign It means a lot of things. For me, it means that God is completely in charge. But if God is completely in charge, then that means what? God is completely in control. The question is not whether or not God is in control. The question is whether or not we can submit to what he's doing. The question is not whether or not God is in control. The question is whether or not can we truly submit to whatever he's trying to do. Submit to his sovereignty. God knows everything. God knows everyone. Let's get personal. God knows everything about you. God knows where you've been. He knows where you are. And he knows where you're headed. He knows you. He knows where you're at. He knows your circumstance. He knows your situation. God doesn't cause bad things to happen to good people. But he allows them to happen so that he can do what he wants to do in our lives. Amen? 
He allows them to happen so that, so that he can work whatever he's wanting to work in our lives. He is fully aware of where we are and what's happening around us. And we have to believe that he knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for us. Amen? Parents have this innate ability to know what's best for their children. All the parents said. Edgar, did you say amen? Prophecy. (laughs) Parents have this crazy ability to know what's best for their children. And if we as parents believe that, then you know that we ultimately must submit to the greatest parent. We must be willing to submit to his sovereignty. And we must realize that desperate situations become a training ground for faith. Our desperate situations simply become a training ground for faith. How many of you this morning would say, Pastor Jimmy, I'm in a desperate situation. Allow God to do what he wants to do in your life. Don't ask him to move it, to remove it. Ask him to give you the strength to get through it. We we submit to his sovereignty. Number two is we serve him as the Savior. I I have news for you. Everybody listen to this. If you don't write down anything else, write, write this down today. Jesus did not rescue you so that he could ruin you. Jesus did not rescue you so that he could ruin you. Jesus wants you to win. Now, sometimes our situations cause us to turn away from Jesus into ourself. Because if we don't feel like Jesus is moving the way we think he should, or we don't feel like Jesus is doing what we think he ought to do, then what do we do? We, we begin to take control. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Enter Abraham and Sarah. I know you promised us a child, but there ain't no child. God, there's no child. Abraham, go sleep with your servant girl. And that has caused the world trouble ever since. We are still dealing with the fallout from that situation. Things get bad, and it's not moving like we think it should. We, we turn our, our, our trust in God to trust in ourselves. And the sad thing is, is the reality is, is it was probably us that got ourselves there to begin with. So many of our circumstances are caused by ourselves. I, I get amazed by all the people who get in debt and choose to make bad decisions when it comes to money and they get this on credit and they buy that on credit and they charge this and they charge that and 10 years later they're looking around and they're so far in debt they can't they can't get out and and what do they do oh god rescue me from this problem and God doesn't begin to give money, what do they do? They, they, they try to take matters into their own hands, and then it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. We have this tendency when things get bad to begin to take control of it ourselves rather than to release it to the Lord and to begin to trust in him. That doesn't mean that there aren't smart decisions that can be made in the middle of tough times. I, I believe in wisdom in Jesus' name. I believe if you don't have a job and you're broke and there's bills to pay, then you probably ought to use some wisdom and get a job. Don't sit and pray, God, bless me. God, just bring me money. Give me a place to live. God, give me manna every morning. Bring the ravens, Lord. You did it for Elijah. Do it for me, oh God. No, I'll tell you this, though. Get up. And get a job. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. 
Do your part while God does his part. But trust in him for the outcome. Somebody say amen. Amen. Bad times. We become impatient. We want to fix it ourselves. But in the good times, it's kind of the same thing happens. In the good times, we want to pat ourselves on the back and say, great job, me. Great job, me. Well, good things begin to happen. We consume ourselves with whatever the results are, and we look at ourselves, and, and we begin to live a life in Meville. Look what I did. Look at what I did. Look at what I did. And then people begin to praise you, say, oh, man, Neville, you are awesome. You are so amazing. That song, dude, that song was, that's the jam. I know you're rich, man. Look at you. I see you brushing it off. See, don't, don't give me that. I see you. But all of a sudden, when things are going good, we turn away from God because then it becomes Meville. Look at what I did. Look at what I've accomplished. Because we have this incredible ability to take our focus off of God, whether the circumstances be good or bad, and lean solely on ourselves. But the secret to contentment is releasing ourselves and grabbing on to God in any and every situation, whether whether in plenty or in want. We must begin to serve him as the Savior. Jesus saved us. Somebody say amen. Jesus saved us. And we must continue to keep ourselves positioned where we remember Jesus saved us. Jesus saved us from ourselves. Why do we keep running back? But know this, Jesus didn't rescue us to ruin us. But Jesus saved us to set us up for victory. Amen? Amen. So we must continue to serve him as our Savior. And when time gets good, we we don't stop serving him and start serving ourselves. We continue to serve him as a Savior. And so we submit to his sovereignty. And regardless of the circumstance, good or bad, we continue to serve him as our Savior. And the last thing that we do is we just have to be sure that he is sufficient. I love what Paul says later on in that verse. In verse 19 of Philippians 4, he says, And my God will meet all your needs, all of your, all of your, do not get your needs confused with your greeds. Do not get your needs confused with your greeds. There's a difference. But he'll supply those needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Trust that God is sufficient. He's more than enough. He is more than enough. Pam, I want to tell you today, I know where you're headed in the next month. I know the challenge that awaits you. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. Do not worry. Do not worry. He's got this. He's got this. Do not worry. Ocean family, do not worry about tomorrow. God knows our situation and he knows our circumstance. Do not worry. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. As long as we continue to serve him as our Savior, he's going to take care of us in Jesus' name. He knows where we are as a church. He's not ignorant to our circumstances. He's not ignorant to to where we are as a church and what our needs are and what our future is. He, He knows it better than we do in Jesus' name. Do not worry. That doesn't mean stop working, but don't worry. Keep working, stop worrying. Keep working, stop worrying. Keep working, stop worrying. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because our contentment 
is not circumstantial. It's spiritual. The secret today, again, is this, is that we can do all things. We can make it through every situation through Christ who gives us strength. Good times and bad times. But whatever the times may be, God has what we need to get through. The secret, I can do all things. I can do everything through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Bow your heads with me this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this incredible secret that comes from the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we know that for many of us, every day seems like a bad day. We, we go through seasons, God, where contentment seems to be just an idea and never a reality. That God, if I could get this, I'll be happier. If I could land this job, I'd be happy. If I, if I could just get that right spouse, I'll be happy. If, if I could make enough money, I'll be happy. If, if you take this away, God, or if you make this happen, God, I'll be happy. But the reality is, that the truth is, is this, is, is that we'll never be happy until we simply learn to rejoice in the Lord. God, will you turn our focus back to you? God, would you help us to embrace the secret today? The secret that simply says the answer is in you. And God, no matter what we're going through today, we, we, many, many of us raised our hands earlier about being in a desperate situation. Lord, whatever that situation is, may we know today that you are sovereign. You know it, and you're in control of it, oh God. Now, whatever you're doing in our lives, God, let us not ask for you to remove it, but God, give us the strength to get through it today so that your purpose and your plan might be worked out in our lives the way you desire for it to be. God, if we're consumed with Meville, God, remove us from Meville today. And let us turn our focus to you. Lord, if we need to be right with you today, help us to get right with you this morning. Perhaps the key to our, to our victory lies in the fact that we need to seek your kingdom and your righteousness this morning. In fact, while we're in this time of prayer, with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here this morning and you're reading this passage of Scripture and the Lord's telling you that you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you that you need to get right with me. The first thing you need to do to overcome in your situation is you need to get right with me. You need to be in right relationship with me. And you're not. You're far from me. You're distant from me. You're not walking in fellowship with me. There is sin in your life, and you need to ask forgiveness, and you need to repent. You need to not just ask for forgiveness, but you also need to turn away from certain things in your life that you're doing. Don't just seek my kingdom, but seek my righteousness. If, if that's you this morning, and you feel the Lord leading you that direction, and you simply need to get right with the Lord, or you need to be in right relationship with Jesus this morning, I want you just to raise your hand. I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with you today. You'd say, you know, Jimmy, I, I, Pastor Jimmy, I think some of my desperation is coming from the simple fact that, that I may not be in right relationship with Jesus, and I just, I want to get there. Raise your hand up high. I want to be able to see you. It's okay. Uh, many of us, man, we, we have to keep going back to righteousness. Heavenly Father, you see the hands that are up today. And Lord, I pray right now that you would continue to speak to their hearts and their lives Lord, I pray that you would lead them to a place of right relationship with you as they are acknowledging that they are not. Holy Spirit, would you help them to ask forgiveness for their sins, but strengthen them to walk away from the things of which they need to turn away from. God, bring victory in their lives today, for the mercies of the Lord are made new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Today's a new day in Jesus' name. 
And Lord, as they come back to right relationship with you and begin to repent of those things, God, would you continue to work in their lives through each and every situation, God, so that the secret that Paul speaks of would become a reality. And God, for each of us today, may we remember to submit to your sovereignty. May we make it an intentional choice to serve you as our Savior. And regardless of what we see around us, God, may we be sure that you are sufficient. For truly my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in Jesus Christ. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, amen.